My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs. I'm excited to share God's word with you today. Are you ready to hear God's word? <clears throat> I want to welcome all of you here. If this is your, if you're a regular attender or if you're a guest, you're visiting with us today. We're ex- extremely honored and glad that you are here. I want to welcome everyone also watching and tuning in by way of YouTube. Uh, I feel like God has a wonderful word for us today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them out. If, you, if you're a note taker like me, go ahead and open up your worship guide, grab your pen, and get ready to take some notes. Um, I want to talk to you today about the heart of worship. Everybody say that with me. The heart of worship. The Apostle Paul was giving uh, some instructions in the book of Corinthians. He was talking to the church in Corinth back in the day. And he was giving them some practical instructions about godly living and living for God. And he, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, church, I'm not trying to help you. I'm, I'm trying to help you and to make things easier for you, not to make things difficult. Now look at this part. But so that you would have an undistracted devotion. Would you say that with me? Undistracted devotion. Serving the Lord constantly with an undivided heart. Would you say that with me? Undivided heart. Okay, I want to talk to you about specifically an undistracted devotion today. I want to talk to you about having an undivided heart. And I've been praying for you this week that you would hear the word of God, that you would be challenged in your own uh, spiritual walk with God, and that God would speak to you even if in a profound way. Some of the things that I'm going to share today are really, really simple. But how do you, how many of you know that some of the simplest truths of God's word are the most profound? And they can make the most difference in your everyday life. So I really want you to lean into this message today as we talk about an undistracted devotion and an undivided heart. I think about my own life, and I've, I've struggled. I've had an, a, a, a divided heart in seasons of my life. I've been pulled away by distractions in certain areas of my life. And I know what that's like to have my attention pulled away from the main thing, right? The, the, uh, the, you heard the saying that says, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And, and sometimes in life... We're distracted, we're pulled away, we're, we're dragged away, we're enticed, and our hearts begin to drift away. And our attention begins, begins to go this way and that way, and we start having an, uh, an, a divided heart. And we, have, and we start having a distracted devotion in our lives. I know what it's like, maybe you know what it's like too. Maybe for you, you start to pray or spend time in the Word or, or, it's a, or, or your to-do list comes up in your mind, right? And you start remembering everything you got to accomplish and, and all the stress and the pressure and your work and your family and your relationships kind of pull your, your attention elsewhere and it makes your heart divided. It makes your devotion cut in half. So maybe it looks like that for you, or maybe you're, you're, you're trying to focus in on your relationship with God, like having a quiet time, having a devotion in the morning, and sometimes things just like the telephone rings. How many of us need to no- learn how to put our phones on do not disturb mode sometimes, all right? Sometimes we, we're just drawn away by the busyness of life. Sometimes the enemy will come in and purposefully try to draw your attention away and to make you a, have a distracted heart. And how many times, I just want you to know today that God wants to draw us back in to an undistracted devotion. God wants to draw us back in to having an undivided heart towards him. Because when we're distracted, we're, we become weak. When we're distracted, we become powerless and ineffective. And when we become divided, we become just this way and that way. And we're tossed easily to and fro. But what would happen 
if we, if, as we are talking about the heart of worship, what would happen if we caught the vision again to have an undistracted devotional life with God? What would happen if we had our hearts changed and molded and shaped by God that we weren't divided in our relationship with him? That's what I want to encourage you in over the next few moments. I want you to, if you have your Bibles, look at at, uh, the book of Luke, chapter 10. It'll be up on the screen as well if you want to follow along. Luke, chapter 10, we're going to start over in verse 38. And it says this, as Jesus... And the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Verse 39. Her sister Mary, everybody say Mary, Mary. sat at the Lord's feet. What was she doing? Listening also to, to what he taught. I want you to stop right there and just notice what's happening right now. The Bible makes it clear, points out this detail on purpose. They were in Mary's home. Likely Jesus knew Mary and Martha. They had a brother named Lazarus and they were pretty close. And so they went into this home and look at this detail. Mary sat at the Lord's feet. And what did she do? She opened up her ears. She gave the Lord undivided attention. Right? Now let's see. Verse 40. But Martha. Everybody say Martha. Martha. But Martha was distracted. This is a key word. Circle that word if you're taking notes. Highlight it. She was distracted by the big dinner or all the things she was doing. She, She was preparing to have Jesus in her homes and it goes on to say she came to Jesus Martha did and said lord does it not does it doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while i have to do all the work by myself do you hear Martha kind of getting frustrated in this i'm doing all this i'm preparing i'm serving the lord and look at my lazy sister over there she's not helping me at all she's not doing anything we're supposed to be serving the lord with with fervor and enthusiasm and doing things right but look at my sister over there jesus why don't you get up and go tell her to just get off of her rear end and come help me <clears throat> you ever felt like that before? Like I do all the work. If something's going to get done, I'm going to have to do it myself. Right? And you look at everybody else and you're like, where's my help? Come on, can you help me? Can you do the dishes? Can you help me with the laundry? Can you do this or that? Whatever it is. But this is what Mary had going on in her. I mean, Martha had going on. In her. <clears throat> and she said, Tell her to come and help me. I want you to pay attention to that verse, that verse 40. I want you to think about Martha. What was her attitude? What was happening with her? It says she was distracted. Some other versions say, uh, But Martha was encumbered with much serving. Another verse says, but Martha, overly occupied and too busy, was distracted with much serving. The message paraphrase says this, but Martha was pulled away, dragged away, enticed by all that she had to do. I looked at that word, that Greek word distracted, and it actually literally means to be pulled away, to be dragged away, or even to be taken captive, to be made prisoner against your own will. The implication here is that Martha wanted to hear Jesus herself. She wanted to be seated 
at Jesus' feet. She wanted to be listening to all the things that Jesus was teaching, but she was being pulled away. She was being dragged away. She was being enticed by all the things she thought she had to do. You see, the Lord is ser- serving. Serving the Lord is certainly not a bad thing. Amen? Serving Him is certainly not wrong in any way. But serving Him without first sitting at His feet is a, di- is a, is a disaster waiting to happen. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Serving the Lord is not wrong or bad, but serving him without first sitting at his feet is a recipe for disaster. You see, Mary wanted to listen to him. She wanted to be undistracted. She wanted to hear him say those teachings about what it means to have abundant life. Martha wanted to listen to him as he explained the glorious mysteries of the kingdom of God. She wanted to listen to him as he taught things like the first shall be last. And if you want to be the greatest, you must learn to be the servant of all. Martha wanted to listen to him when he taught things like pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. She wanted to listen to him. Her heart was there. She wanted to have open ears to him as he said things like, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Just want you to paint this, see this picture of what's happening in the home with Mary and with Martha. But Martha could not listen to him because her heart and her mind had been taken captive By all the things she thought she had to do. And so Jesus says to her. Look at this. Pay attention to this. This is verse 41. Jesus says. But the Lord said to her. My dear Martha. In other translations it says. Martha. Martha. (laughs) You better watch out when the Lord says your name twice. Right? (laughs) Martha. Martha. You are worried and upset over all these details. But there is only one thing. Everybody say, one thing. There is only one thing worth being concerned about it. God bless you. And Mary, look at this, Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken from her. What did Mary discover? Mary discovered the power of an undistracted devotion. She discovered the joy of an undivided heart. She discovered what it meant to be sitting at the feet of Of the Lord and listening to his teachings. While Mary was missing, I mean, Martha was missing out, Mary had discovered the one thing worth being concerned about, right? Sitting at Jesus' feet implies what? That she's ready to learn. That her ears and heart are open. Sitting at Jesus implies submission. All rebellion is gone. I'm not doing things my way anymore. I'm sitting at Jesus' feet. I'm here to learn. I'm here to listen. And I'm here to obey whatever he tells me to do. Sitting at his feet implies faith in who Jesus is. Sitting at his feet implies worship, it implies honoring, it implies reverence toward Jesus, and it implies discipleship. 
How many of us want to grow in our discipleship? We all need to grow in our discipleship to Jesus. And in essence, Jesus was telling busy Mary a very important lesson. And it was this, learn to focus. Your distracted devotion and your divided heart on me. Jesus was saying, in essence, learn to sit at my feet. In the busyness of your life, Martha, learn the power and the joy and the wisdom of learning to sit at my feet. This is the heart of worship. An undistracted, undivided, all-encompassing devotion to Jesus Christ. If you think worship is just about singing on a Sunday morning, guess what? There's much more to worship than that. But what are you doing during the day? And are you sitting daily at the feet of Jesus? This is the heart of worship. It's seen all throughout the Bible in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul discovered this truth as well. As he passionately declared in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, when he said this, I want to know Christ. This is my one thing, Paul said. I'm forgetting everything in the past. I'm counting it all as rubbish. And now I'm pressing on to this one thing. I want to know Christ. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And Jesus again helps our heart to focus. Even in the Gospels, when Jesus taught about the first and the most important and the greatest commandment. What was he doing? He was telling the disciples, this must be your priority. When he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. What is that? That is an undistracted, undivided, all-encompassing devotion to Christ. This is the heart of worship. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. This is the heart of worship. An undistracted, undivided, all-encompassing devotion to Christ. All worship must start there. If it is to be true worship on a Sunday morning or true worship when we get together in our small groups, if it is to be real and authentic, it must start with that heart. How do you develop that heart? If you're here today and that is just not you at all. If you're here today and you're just like, wow, that sounds really good. I want to be more like Mary, but I am a long way from that. Got some good news for you. And I'm going to give you a practical. If I could, if this, is, this is probably the most practical message I'm ever going to speak here at this church. If you're in that place here. How do you do it? How do you cultivate that kind of heart? How do you have. Here's the question I want us to consider in the next few minutes. How do you have. How do you cultivate. How do you develop Mary's heart. In a Martha world. We can look to Mary's example, and we can learn one vitally important, and as I said, extremely practical application point. Here it is. You ready for it? Daily 
devotions. I just want you to think about this in a fresh way this morning. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord and you're like, Brian, this is really elementary. You should have studied a lot harder for this message today. (laughs) But I want to tell you, some of the most profound and life-changing things that you will ever apply to your life are some of the most simple And if you take this and you understand the joy and the power of sitting at the feet of Jesus every single day. And you look at Mary's example and you apply it to your own life. It will transform you. Daily devotions. Learning to sit. At the feet of Jesus. I didn't always love daily devotions. They used to be a chore. It used to be hard and arduous and just horrible. And, and I had to make myself do them. But then once I understood that sitting at his feet was not only what I was supposed to do, but it is so good for my soul. It is so good for my soul to sit and listen to words of life. To sit and accumulate God's wisdom. How many of you know that we cannot do this life in our own wisdom? These daily times of devotion, these daily times of sitting before the Lord, as Mary did, will help us to gain so much needed wisdom for this life. And think about how much pain we can avoid. (laughs) Have you ever thought to yourself, boy, I wish I knew now, or I wish I knew then what I do know now. If you will apply this practice of daily devotions, you will grow in wisdom. You will become more Christ-like in your attitudes and in your decision-making. On your job, in your family, raising your kids. Do you need help? Do you need wisdom? Are you sitting at the feet of Of the one who is all wisdom. I want to illustrate it. I I thought about this like. You watch renowned performers. Or you watch these star athletes. Play football or baseball or whatever it is on the weekends. and, And they have this training regimen. Every single day, day in, day out, again and again and again, they train. And they do the things that they know they need to be disciplined in doing. Why? Because those things, the preparation, the the behind-the-scenes work is what prepares them to be successful in what they're doing. A world-class athlete gets, gets up every single day. And does a certain caliber of core exercises. One of my favorite football players growing up was Jerry Rice. Star wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers. And then he was traded. Who who did he play for after that? The Raiders. Yeah, thank you. But he said this. I may be able to run. I may be able to pass. But I do a thousand sit-ups every single day. And I just thought about that. And then I thought about like concert uh, pianists. Is that how you say that word? In the South, we might call it pianist. No, that's not right. Pianists, right? Okay. Think about professional pianists. (laughs) Thank you. No matter how great 
and skilled this piano player is. That's a good way to say it, right? You will always find him or her doing daily practice, right? If you play any kind of instrument, you know how important it is to spend your time practicing. And pianists do something that's called the scales, right? Professional pianists do it amazingly, gorgeously. Beginners, a little bit of a train wreck. Watch this video clip. There's a story about a guy named uh, Paderewski. I can say it how I want to say it because I'm the, I'm the one saying it, right? But he was a renowned Polish, Polish uh, piano player who lived in the first half of the se- uh, 20th century. And when his government requested that he play concerts in order to help raise money for the war effort, uh, Paderewski... A patriot and a willing citizen said, sure, I'll help you under one condition. If you'll allow me every day to continue playing the scales for three hours a day. And he said, if you'll pay me for eight hours, I will play the scales for three. And they didn't hesitate to accept his offer, but... Let me ask you a question. Why would someone of Paderewski's enormous talent and professional training, why would someone like that insist on playing the scales for three hours every day? Paderewski had a ready answer 
I want you to see it. It's up on the screen. He said this, if I skip one day of scales when I play in concert, I notice. If I skip two days of scales, my coach will notice. And if I skip three days, the world will notice. Regular, regularly playing the scales develops and maintains skill. Dexterity in your fingers to be able to move through the most complex pieces of music with accuracy, with speed. And whatever the, the, the score may call for, with the right pl- practice, this pianist will be able to play incredibly. Without a regular scale of, or without a regular diet of doing these scales... The pianist will most likely fumble around and struggle and perhaps be a little embarrassed about his performance. What's what's the point? The point is this. Every disciple of Christ who desires to cultivate a true heart of worship does their scales every single day. And their scales, is that's called daily devotions. Learning to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his words. I want you to write this down. This is up on the screen. It says this. The source, but don't miss this. If you zoned out, zone back in. Grab this right here. The source for every Christian. That which fuels, ignites, guides, sustains, and empowers absolutely everything is daily time with the master. Are you spending daily time with the master? Do you want to have a true heart of worship? Do you want to be undistracted in your devotion? Do you want to have an undivided heart in your love for God? Well, you can cultivate it. You can develop it. And it's by doing your scales every single day. It's by implementing daily devotions into your life. Amen? I told you it was simple. And I should have studied a lot more, right? But if, you'll pro, if you will apply this simple principle to your Christian life, to your walk with God, to your journey of faith, it will absolutely transform your life. One of the things that I do every, every single day is I show up in the mornings with my Bible, a pen, a journal, I also take my to-do list with me in case something comes to mind. I put it, I, I write it down, and I forget about it. I'll get to it later. But one of the things I do, and, I, and we even do it in our house with our, with our three little boys every single morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning, we're taking time, we take a whole hour to go through, and we study the Word of God together, and we sit at the feet of Jesus together. And we do it really simple. Let me show you the method that we do it. Okay, jot this down if you're taking notes. Here's a really simple Bible study method. It's one way. It's not the only way. It's just the way that we have chosen. It works best for us. First is this. S. We're going to spell soap. Okay. Some of you need to try some soap. Amen. (laughs) Right? Okay, but S, you start with the scripture. You pick a passage of scripture that you want to focus on that day. Don't think about quantity, think about quality. And what I do with my boys, and I say, hey, we read a chapter. Now I want you to pick one verse from that chapter that stood out to you. I want you to just pick one verse that meant something powerful to you. Or one verse that was kind of the key concept of what we read. And I want you to write it down longhand. Scripture. 
And then after that, we're going to go to O. That is observation. Man, we're going to study that scripture. We're going to look at what's the context of that scripture. We don't want to just take verses here and there and pluck them and, and apply them out of context, right? No, we want to say, who's speaking in this scripture right here? Who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? What's the point of what's being said? Where were they? When was this happening? Are there any key words? Are there any repeated phrases? We're observing. We're taking the time to make observations of the text. Next, we go to the, to the hardest part, and that's the A, and that is application. And we're thinking about and asking questions. Okay, so we read this chapter. We have this core verse. We've made all of our observations. Now, so what? What does it mean for me? What does this teach me about God? What is this telling me that challenges me that maybe I need to change my way of thinking on this? Or maybe I need to change a heart attitude that I've had. Maybe I need to do some confessing and repenting. Or maybe I just need to say, praise be to God. Because of his love in Jesus Christ. But we take the time to apply it to our lives. And finally the P. It's prayer. What is prayer but just responding to what God has done for you? What is prayer if it's not just replying to something that you've learned? Something that you've learned about God. What is it that we need to pray about today? How can we ask God to help us apply what we've learned? My friends, if you will take some time every single day to find out what works for you. Maybe soap is a great idea for you. Maybe you need a more structured reading plan. Maybe you need to go to the Christian bookstore and find a workbook that you can work through with some kind of structure. Or maybe you need to, to get with some friends and be able to hold each other accountable and grow together in the Lord. But whatever you need to do, I challenge you today. Would you make daily devotions a priority for your life? And I promise you, if you will do that, the Lord will transform your heart. And you'll go from being distracted and divided to being full of, I got to spend time with him today. And it goes from drudgery to joy. And it goes from, oh gosh, I got to discipline myself to do this today, to I cannot wait to get alone with my Jesus, to hear what God's word wants to speak to me today. And friends, if you will do that, if you will do that, you just think about what would happen in your life. What would happen in your family if you developed that kind of heart of worship? What if you actually learned from Mary's example? And you applied this and you sat at Jesus' feet every single day. What if you chose to do the one thing that Jesus said was the greatest and the most important and the first commandment? And what if you truly embraced that command with everything you've got? What if we learn to feed ourselves? One of the things that breaks my heart and discourages me as a pastor sometimes when people say, hey, pastor, we're leaving your church. We're just not getting fed. Okay, what does that tell me? You do not know the art of feeding yourself. And you think that you can come to church and hear a 30-minute message and have them, hey, you got a meal once a week, but you're not eating, you're not feeding, you don't know how to use your, your own spoon and your own fork to feed yourself. 
Hello, somebody say amen. Amen. (laughs) Sometimes we got to get to the point where we're not babies in Christ anymore. We're growing in maturity. Amen. My friends, you're going to be way malnourished if all that you're getting is what you get when you come to church on Sunday. All right, you love me, don't you? All right, I love you too. Sometimes you just got to tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Amen.